Hey, Big Pod. Hey. I have a question for you. Ask. So, uh, say you're a business owner, right? And uh, you produce yeah. laptops. And uh, you want to do, like, this open source thing and uh, boot, like, firmware that is open source on these laptops. But the documentation, you don't understand. So you hire these contractors, right? Yeah. And uh, it turns rather hilarious. Three other size men. Yeah. That's basically what it turns into. It's like, hey, I might buy one of these laptops now, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, Unless your state gets banned. Well, That's also an I'll, option. The, I mean, it might get banned if, you know, the guy listens to this episode. But in the meantime, I do, I actually do kind of want to buy buy one of these laptops just so I can boot Nomo S on it. <laughs> and then uh, not only use Linux, I want to use the Russian Linux. Okay. Hey, guys. This is No Tux Allowed. <laughs> I am your host, Josh, and I've got this fool of a guy over here with me. His name is Big Pod. Hello. So, uh, Big Pod, I, I mentioned this right at the start of the show. Uh, so, so uh, the this laptop I kind of want to buy because it's not an outrageous price for a laptop. Yeah. It is produced by this company named uh, Malleable. Yeah. And... Uh, as far as we know, this is a company made by one guy that is yeah. producing these laptops, and he sells them with either Windows or Linux. I don't know. Yeah. I haven't looked to see what version, what distro he's shipping or anything like I that. I believe it's Ubuntu based on the on their, or his, depending on how I want to say it, uh, a marketing material, it's some sort of Ubuntu. Which would make sense, because, you know, and... Ubuntu... And they even have a dual boot option where they sell a dual boot laptop. Yeah, so the next time Windows updates decides that they're going to update, when uh, Microsoft decides that they're going to update their bootloader, they can brick your system for you. Uh, let me let me squash that right away. That was before the before UFI and GPT, or uh, yeah, is it GPT? They're called the. the uh, yeah, before that, because uh, MBR is, is piece of shit, and well, Linux uh, apparently Linux did the same thing, just far less uh, frequently because you didn't actually boot into because you always booted into the same bootloader. Grab, if you were booting into Windows bootloader, Linux would do the same thing. Well, anyways, uh, this. This company decided that they were going to flash their laptops with Core Boot because, you know, they're inspired by System76, which does this on basically all of their systems. Yeah. So uh, they reach out to a couple contractors, uh, the first one being Nine Elements, which is a name that I've heard in the past. I don't don't hear about this, this group too often, but they're, they're basically firmware developers. Yeah. And uh, th they reach out to them, and... Uh, Decided that they were just going to send them a laptop to uh, work on, basically and... to evaluate if if it is possible to do that and how easy would it be. Yeah. Well, uh, first of all, we're dealing with firmware on a laptop. Normally, yeah. these are very custom tailored to that specific board model. Yes. So, and uh... in this case, we're talking about a white label a machine, so third party produced then customized by the seller so for example system 76 uses clever machines i don't know what exactly malleable uses but as far as i know according to other sources our journalistic sources it is not clever i know that yeah. much <clears throat> well anyways uh th this this company gets working on this, and it's taking them a bit longer than uh, turns out that the guys actually, actually, novel. the first first off, it wasn't actually the time that was the problem. The first time, it was the price. Oh yes, because that's right. It was supposed to be for each board fifty to one hundred k, which is just outrageous, apparently. Although it's a, it's a. 
a firm where you're building and you're you're going to be selling potentially thousands, ten thousands of those machines. Therefore, you should be able to amortize your cost across all of them. So maybe that doesn't sound so bad. So their cheapest laptop being eighteen hundred dollars, we'll assume that they want to take like a twenty-ish percent profit because that's actually fairly standard uh, yeah. for for hardware. So In general uh, standard. So your engineering budget behind the system, because so you have the cost of the base system itself. We'll assume that's probably like the first seven eight hundred dollars, and then yeah. So let's so, let's 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 make it around. So let's say it's a thousand dollars. Yeah, so somewhere around there. So. We're talking about like a practical engineering budget in somewhere around six to seven hundred dollars per yeah. laptop. That's actually fairly reasonable. <laughs> yeah, because uh, especially realistically, to sell something like more more than few thousand units. Yeah, that I mean, if you sp- if you sell more more than a few thousand units, you you've basically made your money back on the laptop already. Yeah. So uh, that's actually a reasonable price because. Uh, uh, especially when, you know, uh, these valuable guys have already done some work on porting Corbett to their system. And At they least just needed according help with... to what they say. Yeah. Uh, so uh, they all they realistically needed was some additional help with debugging, which, you know what? Yes. That'd be, if I was from Nine Elements, hey. <laughs> that's a steal. That's a steal. Yeah. That, that's a lot of, that's, that's a lot of, you know, the figuring out the logic of how you want to approach things done for you. <laughs> <laughs> but that's where things hit a, a somewhat of a problem because as nine elements themselves say this uh, there was there was problems with the whole idea it was just debugging and quoting their own blog post they say throughout the engagement we encountered communication challenges including frequent status updates request and misalignment between expectations and technical realities which to me tells me that there wasn't actually as much done as they were saying it was and to go on quoting them the initial firm required considerable work before it could be tested on hardware which understandably caused some delays but that's when the communication from Malibal actually became less constructive and less good, which is which we can see in the blog post we're currently talking about by yeah, well, Malibal. Uh, so the Nine Elements team uh, came back with a thing here saying that hey, you didn't. There's not. There's. A lot more work that needs to be done here. So it's going to take us 160 total hours or 20 days. Which, you know, that's pretty... That's uh, still pretty aggressive there from from a uh, firmer perspective. Yeah, especially if you're actually doing testing and bullshit like that. Well, it turns out that uh, Malleable wants to keep their costs down. So they said no. And uh, Nine Elements then comes back saying that, hey, we can make a deal here. Uh... How about we just get a commission off of every laptop sold? Malibu says, mm, that sounds like a great way of keeping the cost down. However, it's, it's, this is where it starts to get wild, by, by the way, guys. To quote uh, Malibu here, this really, uh, this is really how shameless they are in trying to take you for every penny you're worth. You'll see what I mean when you find out the actual scope of the work required for this job below. <laughs> After reviewing our schematics and motherboard, uh, Christian, which is from Nine Elements, said, There are not debugging capabilities on the board. We had actually informed him that there is, in fact, a UART port on the motherboard for debugging pur- purposes. And However, in future <laughs> the blog post, we're going to find that basically the UART port was not exactly well maintained. To put it lightly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, basically, Christian ca- comes back saying that uh, th- this port's just bu- buggered. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, they get to exchanging pictures, emails about it. And they eventually decide, you know what? We don't want to work with this nine elements team. In fact, we don't want to work from 
with anybody from Germany. And At that's all. when Malibal banned the whole country of Germany from buying their products. For life. Yes. <laughs> so, on to the next consultant. On to the next victim, shall we say. <laughs> yeah, th- uh, this is 3M Deb, which is a company I never heard of. <laughs> yeah, me neither, but appears to be pretty and, somewhat known, at least. Uh, almost immediately, there's issues. Because uh, the very first sentence here, uh, the... Uh, they're saying that the interactions that they've had with them, they've encountered delays and flexibility, and basically borderline accusing 3M Deb of lying about how they actually operate their business, <laughs> which is, uh, this is stepping on some to some toes here. Uh, yes. Yeah, they're this this is like uh, bo- we're already at borderline uh. Uh, lawsuits here just for uh, just yeah. for slander. Yeah, d- d- here uh, I think this blog post could be a very could be a center for a for a defamation lawsuit if somebody got uh, got too problematic. <laughs> and they basically the problem, but uh, according to Maldibal, is that they have essentially two two products. Yeah. One is a branded uh, core boot. The other one is a custom, unbranded core boot. And even just for evaluation, you have to pay a few thousand dollars, which, sorry to tell you, but that's normal in such a product, such a project. It's yeah. Completely normal. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, remember pro- that even, even if you send your laptop or a computer to a repair shop, you're go- even if they just look at the laptop, you're gonna get one hour of repair work to pay for. Yeah, uh, that's how big it is. Pod, I have a business proposition for you. Uh, I would like to send you uh, a product, right? That uh, yeah. requires some software support for it, right? I'm going to send this to you from my end, uh, my end of Cornfields, Ohio, to Slovenia. Okay, and uh, I want you to pay the shipping for this. In the meantime, I want you to volunteer your time to look over this product here and all the source code that I ship with you and get a quote back to me within 24 hours of receiving the product. Yeah, that's not going to (laughs) happen. Sorry, but that's at least, well, shipping, that's at least a couple of hours of work for evaluation purposes. Uh, I'm going to write you a, a uh, a, f- a bill for at least a few hundred euros. Sorry. Oh, okay. I, I thought I'd try. I thought I'd try. <laughs> <laughs> not going to work that way. That's not how things work in business world. Okay. But, yeah, uh, they, they go through a wonderful numbered list as, you know, I'm swatting a fly that decided to buzz by my ear. Uh, of it, ethical they, they were... concerns by their pricing strategy. If we go from the top of their list, number one is artificial barriers. By that, they mean that ma- just making an unbranded core boot costs significantly more than creating a branded core boot s- firmware, which basically means, hey, w- we're going to give you a ad su- subsidized core boot for, I don't know, half the price. Are you okay with that? Or we can pay double, and you're gonna get unbranded one. Well, to be fair, if I was working on a product for for somebody else, that and uh, they didn't want me to put my brand on there, of course I'm gonna build. Of course I'm going to send the build them extra for it because you know, uh, I have ran a business, and yeah. you know, uh, I know what it's like to try to get out and do advertising. It's yes, it sounds easy. But there's a reason why consultants for for it exist, and why you pay these other companies to do all the advertising for you. That's there is a reason YouTubers make so much money on on uh, targeted advertisement. Yeah, that too. Some YouTubers though. Yeah, some. Uh, Not us. Others others just spend all their money before they even get it. If you have a company who who wants to do 
advertisement with a podcast like us, email us at contact at taxbase.com. <laughs> I guarantee you that our rates are actually fairly reasonable compared to uh, the standard YouTuber. Yes. Now to continue with the article. Number two, misalignment with open source principles. Essentially, number one, but uh, slightly different because this is open source project. You should you should be giving us better things or more open things like emphasize, emphasize accessibility, collaboration, and community-driven development. They are a consulting company, not not a project. Sorry. Yeah, uh, engineers aren't free. Yes. Then number three is profits over progress. Again, basically the same thing. Oh. Lack of transparency is number four. Again, I, like he's trying to invent so many ways, or they trying to invent so many ways to say the same thing. Wouldn't you agree? They they really are. <laughs> Then you have number five is potential conflict of interest, which is basically because they are a contributors to co- core boot project, but they sell a branded version. Well, uh, as far as I can tell, though, uh, this brand isn't like a physical brand that's on the laptop itself. No, it's no, literally it's... it's literally just a firmware splash that you get when you yes. first turn on like any computer. Yes. And you know what? <laughs> What's the problem with that? He probably You're wants y- Malibal brand, not not well, their the share or the whatever th- it's called. Here's the thing about Coreboot, right? Coreboot, all that is is it's just reading a configuration file that's on a read write disk. Yes. You can change anybody can change yes. that. <laughs> it's uh, I'm it's not actually gonna not go, hard. I'm not gonna say much on the on how hard it is because well, we're gonna talk about how hard. Uh, about skills later, but there is number yeah. six, discouraging customization, which is again the num- number one through four again. Yeah. So after some back and forth on pricing, th- there was an offer made. We will pay 150 an hour for the service until the project is complete. And they want to have direct access to the developer, which possibly, but depends on how annoying you are. So they wanted so. daily reviews of work, which unless you actually know what, what you're doing, you wouldn't want that because you wouldn't understand it. And if you know what you're doing, you won't be hiring a consultant unless you have way too much work with other stuff. Which so, I guess if they tried, yeah, it probably isn't that that's the issue. So let's let's to to explain why there's an issue with uh, the daily update thing on progress, right? Uh, when w- hardware is fundamentally different from software, there's a reason why we have these things called drivers that exist on a Linux yes. system. Now, uh, when you're talking to Hardware directly, you're talking raw machine code. Yes. And uh, you might have like these user space API tools for, that that's available f- via the courtesy of your, like your Linux kernel, such as your your Mesa uh, Mesa drivers, your Falcon, your VA API interfaces, uh, yep. your your V4L2 interfaces, and so on. This is the stuff that those interfaces talk to. And uh, this is not easy. So I guarantee you, $150 an hour, probably the first week, somebody's looking over a physical manual reading reading elect- electrical specifications n- uh, presented to them by your hardware vendor. Yes. Because they need to know how this stuff works be- because you probably only sent them one test unit and they don't want yeah. to accidentally put one too many zeros and wind up cooking their one and only test unit also that <laughs> and even the whole daily review thing it's annoying as a, as a software developer who who also sometimes work on a contract basis i cannot do daily review weekly it makes sense and even then i i'm gonna be working on this 
Do you want me oh. to be working on this or do you want me to be talking with you about absolutely nothing? Because that's the reality of what you're doing. Uh, let me tell you uh, my experience with daily reviews in, in not necessarily a software role, but like in manufacturing. Yeah. Because uh, that, that is what my background is. Uh, I, I worked in industrial manufacturing. In fact, I still do. Hey, Josh, what'd you do today? Oh, I read a book. Which book? Uh, the manual on the machine that I'm going to be working on tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Hey, Big Pot, what you did today? I, I, I read the first few files of, of the program I'm going to be working on. Tomorrow, I'll, I open the AD, IDE and set up the environment. Then I might start coding. Welcome to reality. <laughs> yeah. Well, Leave me alone for a reality. week and I may have some effect for you. Yeah, uh, if, if you need, like, a further explainer, uh, go g uh, go to gitlab.com slash tenlyj slash dot files. Look at my open box configuration. It's pretty simplistic. However, print it out with a 10-point font on, like, standard American letter paper. You're going to get 200 pages. Yes. That's just for an XML file on a on a window manager. I would yeah. hate to see the core boot source code. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> and now, uh, for those of you who have daily stand-ups at your company, you very well know what I'm talking about and what we are talking about, because that's what we're talking about. Basically, it's stand-ups just after, not before. Yeah. Well, anyways, due to this experience with 3M Dev, they decided that they did not want to work with 3M Dev, or in fact. Anybody from Poland for life. Yes. <laughs> Banned. <laughs> so, uh, this blog post gets circling around. It, uh, there, it gets there, there is more. There is more. Yeah, then there, there... they complain to Corbut, at which point the, it goes not nowhere, apparently. But they, they, are, they are told that they cannot really dictate terms to consultants who, who consult on making software firmware for core boot but one of the other uh, core boot min, uh, core boot leaders Matt de Villiers, who is better known on the internet as Mr. Chromebox Mr. Chromebox sorry uh, decided he's gonna try and help out and he here's here's our third story <clears throat> apparently Matt is the type of person who will suck the the will to leave out of you and then leave you for that. Or that's somewhat of a quote from the Malibal page. I added, added a word or two there. He, yeah, he is unprofessional, unreliable, untrustworthy, irresponsible, and incompetent. This is why you don't work with individuals. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And even then, like, uh, based on previous two cases i'm not sure it's really him already and we're gonna get to the to rest of why i'm so sure about that later well, uh big pod their experiences with this guy caused him to ban amd products for, for life <laughs> oh yes matt works for amd so even though they are they were already thinking and my guess is probably already worked on an amd laptop they decided they're going to ban AMD products for life. Yeah, so uh, let me pull up the product page here real quick. Are all these systems Intel? Let's see, let's see. Let's I think see. Intel, are. Intel, 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 Intel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. So they, they don't sell an AMD laptop right so, now. So, Mr. Mister CEO of Malibal, you decided at this point to go... And ban half of desktop and laptop CPU market share. Because yeah. apparently the the, uh, the third option, Qualcomm, is not available anymore. So that, that 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 should be the news one day as well. But we're gonna wait till it gets more more known about that. Well, anyways, uh there the the we're going to have a link to their blog post in the description because uh, the the section uh, w concerning their work with Matt 
is probably the longest section. Yes, and, and at the very end into, of it, into uh, making making fun of AMD a bit and yeah. how they have emergency work, and but also about how even Matt had problems with the UART connector. So I really do think it was a a, a technically not well working connector. Not that nine elements had a I didn't know what they were doing. Yeah, well, anyways, due to their experience with uh, Matt DeVillier or Mr. Chromebook, they have decided to ban the entire state of Maryland for life. Banned. <laughs> and <laughs> here we go. Now we have also have responses by Nine Elements and Corbut. But before that, there is another, there is a few statements or at least one statement that we want to talk about that f- came on Twitter, specifically by somebody who already has experience working with, uh, with many core boot. verified products. In fact, yes. uh, I have one. Let me go grab it real quick. <laughs> so, for those of you who do not know, that we're talking about System76, who basically, as far as I know, every one of their products is actually a core boot enabled system. While, as you can see, yeah. So, uh, I don't know what Big Pie was just talking about because you know I took off the headphones and walked away. Yeah, uh, and I would so, say I said most of System seventy six systems are I have, enabled. I have this wonderful System seventy six Lima Pro that was produced in twenty nineteen nice. that I bought brand new like a month after they released it, so it's been around for a minute. And does it, it have core boot? boot? Yeah. It does. It's verified working. Except right now because, you know, I have it actually kind of gutted. <laughs> <laughs> so, the principal engineer at System76, uh, Jeremy Soler, on his personal Twitter account, or as it's now known as X, uh, said three words. Skill issue, dumbasses. In response to the Tweet by Malibal uh, account, don't support the Corbut project. So the direct post about the about the blog post we we're just talking about. And and it's important to note that in the one of the replies, somebody asked how many pro- pro- products were Corbut pro- powered, and Jeremy just said a lot. Yeah, like basically every single machine that System76 sells has has core boot, and they yeah. refresh those machines almost annually. So yeah. he's been busy, and it makes sense for for uh, Jeremy <laughs> to actually see this because you know he probably follows the core boot project on Twitter. Yeah, and uh, you know when you're following to. somebody when you're following somebody on Twitter, you see it when people uh, tweet with with hashtags for the thing that you're following. So yep. this is probably how he encountered this post. He he probably didn't even know who this company even was to begin with. Yeah. So, anyways, because he decided to say that, they decided to ban the entire state of Colorado for life. Because that's Banned. where System 76 is. Yep. <laughs> Banned. <laughs> okay, so now let's go to the responses by uh, groups that were directly touched by the blog post. So let's first go into the response by Nine Elements, which is definitely shorter. Definitely and shorter and definitely much more professional to read. Yes. <laughs> they have a they have somewhat of a clarification of timeline and they clarified that n- no money was exchanged for their service since it was still in an evaluation period. But Essentially, the <clears throat> most work was done between in May 2023, where it was first approached, and then after May 2024, or M- March 2024, when they sent them urgent requests to develop core boot and EDK2 firmware, along with embedded controller firmware under a very tight timeline, but no firm, no formal contract was in place. Therefore, it was, as they said, working good fate. Yeah, so 
Uh, you're a fairly well-known brand. Like, uh, I've heard of your name before, at least. So, uh, and you're fairly popular with, like, del delving into, like, firm firmware, resolving issues, porting things over. So, you're a bit of a known quantity. And next thing you know, you have, like, this small hardware vendor that, uh, you know, you know, you you want to support, but they can't. But they're having issues with saying that your price is a little too high. They they want you to at least look at your product first. Yeah, I'd throw them a bone and go like, yeah, let, just send it to me, and we'll figure something out afterwards. Seems fine. I've done. I know I've done that with customers before. Yeah, and as they as, as we mentioned before, they did say that there was a misalignment between expectation and technical reality, which, as I said, means that there was a lot more work to be done than what they said. But communication seemed to break down, at which point Malibal seemed to, uh, seemed to say that there won't be any, any further engagement. So Nine Elements uh, cleaned the hardware and sent it back. With no no billing and no no strings attached, completed on professional terms. So yeah, but, but, and uh, they're coming out with us saying that hey, our our team seemed pretty constructive from our from our viewpoint. So uh, you can just have this back, and uh, we just don't want to work with you anymore. See ya. Yeah. <laughs> That's basically what they did. <laughs> Which hey, and uh, yeah. On the other hand, there is also an. Response by Corbut, which basically said that outside of any NDA, which of course you're gonna gonna be signing NDAs when you work on such a thing, especially if there is no money exchange beforehand, like a relation period. You, they they had like pro the Malibal team seem to have problems because consultants have a strong track record of delivering for their customers on a variety of platforms like embedded, laptop, desktop, networking equipment, servers. And they, they seem to be very friendly and happy to help. Yeah. But and, there uh, was you know what? issues, at least issues with hardware were definitely there. According to CoreOS, Core, Core, Core Boot team. Yeah, and uh, I would be surprised if like they shipped that they shipped a product that did not have hardware, because you know this is a product that's technically not even released yet. Yeah. So of course it's going to have issues. And even because, if you know, it was, this was definitely had to be an a development system, not a not a standard the standard selling system because. Why else would it have a UART header? Yeah. Give it so anyways, I, I recommend that you give uh, the links in the description to read to further go down this uh, rabbit hole of hilarity because I thought it was hilarious and uh, it definitely made my Thursday a lot better. <laughs> yeah. But uh, Big Pod, I want to move on to some news that I am personally excited about. Like so excited I wanted to talk about this more than the Malleable, but of course, Big Pod wanted to talk Malleable, and uh, he had some pretty hilarious insights because, you know, unlike me, who only read, like, the one article, he read everything else. <laughs> so, uh, we have an, we have a blog post on, on the Gnome blog, uh, and the way the Gnome blog functions is that each individual uh, contributor has, like, their own little subsection of it. Well... This is from a guy named Adrian Adrian Voke. And uh he he the TLDR of this is, is that he wants to take Gnome OS and turn it into a daily drivable general purpose operating system. Now, if you're not familiar with Gnome OS is, uh Big Pod, can you explain like what the intention of Gnome OS actually used to be apparently? Gnome S is supposed to be the development version of GNOME. Or of, uh, an OS for development of GNOME. Yeah, so uh, this is <clears throat> just enough Linux to boot GNOME. Nothing else. Like, uh, but, there's no package managers. But it is important no. to know that it is actually a, a, a 
initiation point for many of the many of the technologies that are now mainstay in Linux, like in reality OS3, which which is behind RPM OS3 and Flatpaks, and even arguably Flatpaks stem from the things that GNOME OS was trying to do. Yeah, because uh, it's not that like, GNOME OS was, was came out with these things trying to like you know put push like the the Linux desktop forward. Uh, what they wanted was a GNOME that's easily reproducible, so. If I ins- if I install Gnome OS, I get the same Gnome OS version that uh, you you would get, Mister Big Pod, which is the yep. same version of Gnome OS that the Gnome developers are using. Which means that when we're when we're working on like these patches for Gnome, they should theoretically be the same exact patches across all of our systems. So it should yeah. work the same. Yeah, and even That's- when you're trying to make changes, <clears throat> you just make changes on things you actually make changes, not affect any other thing that a specific distro was changing themselves. Yeah. And uh, that's basically what Gnome OS was. It's just like, this is upstream Gnome as raw as Gnome can be. <laughs> and uh, it it is a system that I have tinkered around with. Like, they came out with like an actual installer for it so you could install it to hardware. And ever since then, I have occasionally, you know, did the thing that I normally do and Let's install. Let's install Nomos and see how long we can daily drive it before it inevitably breaks. Because guess what it does? Sometimes, uh, sometimes they push an update through and then, you know sends everything on their stable range to hell. <laughs> like you know, uh, I had Network Manager disappear one day, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that was an interesting issue. Uh, just like what happened to my internet connection? Or I had I had sudden loss of a Linux kernel coming through an update once. That was hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> so. The reason I am looking forward to this is because it's another distro to, or a general purpose distro to be immutable or atomic and using OS3 in some way, which is really good. And if they can be closer to what I like, better for everybody. Yeah, and when we're... And when we're talking about immutable, this is one of those few distros that actually these what well one of these few immutable distros that actually do the immutable thing right. As in, uh, there we're not do- getting real fancy with like ButterFS snapshots. Yes. Uh, we're we're not like r syncing down entire like uh I- ISO containers, uh, like some mm. like some of these distros are doing. But it's literally what should be like. Pulling down an entire image. Yeah. It, it's working through like an image, much like how uh, your containers work, uh, if you're familiar yeah. with Docker and Podman. And uh, I'm certain that if you, you are the home labber and uh, you go to uh, update your containers, it's actually a pretty seamless process. Yeah, it should be. You just and, run a new uh, new image and that's it. And a new, new co- build a new or run a new container and new image is pulled and that's it. No problem. Yeah, and anyways, uh, Adrian here, uh, he he is pushing this forward. And uh, if if you don't know if you don't know uh, what Adrian's background is, he's he's the guy that was behind Carbon OS, which is another immutable distro that uh, prioritizes GNOME. But uh, they're taking he's he's uh, using his experience from that to uh, work work on GNOME OS and. Uh, work on it as a platform. And I think that this is actually going to be a fairly big deal. Because uh, KDE came out with KDE Neon, like back in the day, said all the same things about KDE Neon that the, the GNOME teams currently these days say about GNOME OS, where, you know, this is, they were saying stuff like, uh, this is this is KDE as uh, KDE is being developed. Uh, if you want to install it, you can, totally, you can totally install it, but it's just for development purposes only. Well, uh, it turns out that people just used KDE Neon uh, yeah. as like their daily drivers, and eventually it got to a point where it's just like uh, they kind of had to take it seriously. Yeah, and uh, there are some people that want to do that with GNOME with a uh, GNOME as well. Uh, I mostly did it out of curiosity, but I do know a couple of people that do actually do run GNOME OS as their daily driver, 
as crazy as they can be. But, uh, and I know that if they read this blog post, they're probably excited about it because the biggest th- the biggest hurdle that uh, realistically we have on the Linux desktop with these immutable systems is that there is a, there no matter how hard you try, there is going to be a barrier of entry. Yeah. Because not every single flat pack is packaged as well as I personally think that it could be. I can't tell you how many flat packs I would download from FlatHub and install on my system that I would then have to fix something with. Like say, uh, Steam being a primary example. I don't, uh, my Steam drive is mounted over an NFS share on my server because, you know, I'm weird. But in order to open up uh, the Steam flat pack to my server, I have to either run this long stringy string of a command to be able to uh, to be able to open that up. That's part of the sandboxing, which uh, I get I get understand from like a security first mindset that you don't want the that you don't want your flat pack to be able to touch an external disk on your system or you know a non standard location where the the application normally would be ran. But the, there are some applications, like say, uh, I ran into, I was testing around with like the shortcut video editor from FlatHub at one point. Well, they didn't enable they didn't enable the portal for hardware acceleration. Oh, <laughs> so I had to fix that. Uh, Blender had had all kinds of issues uh, when they first came out with the flat pack, and say, and even Lutris ran into issues when they they, they were developing the flat pack Be- because it turns out that documentation for building a flat pack package is way way harder to parse parse and actually and and actually understand as like a a human being that is probably not like a typical developer of a program to actually understand yeah because i'll be honest with you i know how to build a snap package i know how to build an app image I have yet to be able to successfully build a flat pack. <laughs> I think I managed it once. Yeah. Uh it's a bit of a nightmare. And like if NomoS turn if the NomoS approach t- uh actually take kicks into like a more mainstream fashion, more similar to like your Fedora Silver Blues Silver Blues or like uh your OpenSUSE Aeons and so on, uh take take an approach. I think that this is something that will be addressed because when yes. Gnome decides that they're going to actually work on something and decide that they're going to make it better, yes, they do remove features that uh, you know some people really like, but they tend to really smooth things out. Like I can't tell you how clean the Gnome desktop looks by default compared yeah. to like any out of the box. Besides maybe Pantheon on elementary OS, there is no desktop on Linux that looks better than GNOME, in my personal opinion. They did a wonderful job with that with that Advaita theme. And uh, it shows, because if you look at all the GNOME applications, they all match the theme. It's a very cool-looking system. Yeah. I mean, yes, if uh, you... And this matters for, like, the the new user, you know, because they haven't taken time to look at, like, these Grovebox themes, these uh, Arc themes, or uh, these candy themes that you see some people post on the Unix porns. But uh, it's one thing that I actually hate about when my experience is with Microsoft Windows, because Windows just looks bad to me. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah after using after using but, a known desktop for like a solid month <laughs> yes but the point uh on windows is that windows doesn't care for your your theming of applications that's on applications whereas well, on linux it is the os that care about theming not the applications well yes i mean uh we we can we can talk about client versus server side decorations all day it's not but, just that, but, uh, it's the, the fact that the framework is themed on 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 the OS level, not on the app level. That's the big issue, Yeah. if you ask me. That's why, especially when you put on a GTK desktop a Qt app, or on a Qt desktop a GTK app, where things break down. 
and that and that's why it's a lot more jarring because you you you're used to a cohesive unit whereas on windows it's not as jarring because you're used to not seeing cohesive things yeah well anyways uh he does talk about into like does talk a little bit into uh the the concerns uh that the the gnome foundation could have with like investing into gnome os because operating systems are not cheap to develop even if there's just linux distros uh yeah. there there's a time investment involved and you know uh this guy's getting paid paid to paid by the gnome foundation to work on this so they want to make sure that his time is being actually spent for something that, for a worthwhile adventure so he, so in order to push this forward he would need to justify this to the gnome foundation yeah. Uh, because you, right now all the GNOME Foundation op offers is a Git repository, a build server, and a repository for you to download stuff from. That's what they do. Uh, that's what they do for many projects for for GNOME. But uh, this is still now be, that you're actually wanting to push this as like a general purpose uh, operating system. Well, now you have to be able to have like a forum section of some kind. That way you can do. That way you can help users with issues that they would encounter. You need to invest in documentation because, you know, normal people need to understand how to use this thing. And uh, the GNOME OS documentation, kind of poor. Uh, so, uh, and he's talking about the char charging users for GNOME OS under a pay-for-what-you-want kind of model. Where basically uh, they give you like a, a forced entry into like a price tag and uh, you can pay as much as you want. Starting from zero dollars, which that's like the elementary OS approach, which I don't necessarily hate, but I imagine that some people won't like it. And uh, he does comment that uh, he doesn't think that he's going to be like uh, offering support for like the enterprise space, but he doesn't necessarily like actually kill the idea of it. But uh, he he does say that Nomo S is not for servers, so maybe your workstation. Of course, <laughs> of course. And the he still has he still doesn't quite have the proposal finished for it. And he so, so uh, I want to see what like this proposal actually looks like when you know he actually does publish it. But I am definitely going to be watching this because uh, I if if this actually becomes a thing. Uh, I might just make the move to Noma us because you know huh. I, I, I don't hate it. And I think I'm gonna stay on my preferred immutable distro for now. I mean, you write your own container for it. Of course, you're gonna use it. <laughs> <laughs> there are several reasons I want to stay on that. For one, the one thing I disagree with Adrian is the whole idea of whether going uh, whether going what he calls hybrid immutable model which is a way where you can still install something on your immutable system is good or bad which if you ask me it's good yes it do it doesn't promote uh, a development even though it still could it also provides a far superior user experience in the meantime but i do do champion uh, an existence of uh immutable as that doesn't have that because that will promote better development of those things which then can be incorporated into better immutable asses like ublu s Yep, and uh, I I think that uh, any improvements made in Nomos is going to have far-reaching effects for, for this yeah. stuff. So yeah, uh, I I look forward to see the work that's done here, and I also look forward to to uh, a couple of other things because uh, uh, just last week when we were talking with Savvy Nick, uh, there there came out an update, literally like half an hour before we started recording the show. So uh, not really a whole lot of time to actually collect information. Not that we'll there was or still is a whole lot of information behind this yeah but uh there we have some news from linux so uh sorry sorry big pod we're bringing tux back in <laughs> i guess i need to buy a penguin 
But anyways, uh, so last week, uh, Greg, Greg Crow Hartman, uh, came, came into and, uh, dropped a commit message into the Linux kernel and dropping several container or several, uh, maintainers from, uh, the Linux Maintainers project. list from an official Linux maintainers list, several, several con contributors. Yeah. What, uh, but what do they have in common? Well, uh, they all work in Russia. Yeah. Yeah. Now, uh, there's a there's a couple issues here. First of all, the Linux Foundation ha is headquartered in the United States of America. Yeah. In yeah. the United States of America, we have these things called sanctions on Russia, which means yeah. that, technically speaking, they can't legally do business with... Uh, with uh, you know Russia or anybody considered a tier one ally of Russia, basically like uh, uh, uh let's super not, uh, super I'm, good friends not, of Russia. I don't know. Yeah, from the top of my head, who would that be? I I wouldn't know off the top of my head right now. I either <laughs> to be to be <laughs> honest with you, but uh, that's what that's what sanction laws say. Yeah. So, uh, realistically, uh, so with these container, with these maintainers, it means that the, the Linux Foundation can't technically legally pay them for like their work, and uh, they can't accept any work from these guys either. So, uh, these driver, so uh, there's a there's a lot of legal questions concerned with like uh, accepting contributions from these guys, even in an open source project, and it is. So they they did they did the thing that uh, they thought was smart and decided to just drop these maintainers. Well, uh, it turns out that Russia likes its free and open source software, and uh, there is a possibility that Russia might be considering forking Linux. Yep. And uh, Big Pot, explain to me why they would want to fork Linux and not move to BSD. Because Linux is far far ahead on the desktop and mobile space. And because there has been a lot a lot better driver support for more general hardware. Uh, since... Oh, so more than just your Intel Haswell CPU? Yes. Okay. I mean, I, I understand that BS, BSD systems operated off of some newer stuff these days, but, uh, you know, last I, last I tried to install free BSD on, like, you know, my ThinkPad that was made back in uh, 2018, I, uh, the Wi-Fi alone could not uh, even reach a single megabit of bandwidth. <laughs> let's, let's remember that, uh, what's his name? Uh, the, the router OS is based on um, BSD, so OpenSense and the other one, both still don't support ARM CPUs. Yeah. Because so, the, the well, it's free BSD, doesn't support ARM. Well, I think that they have a Raspberry Pi image now, but I think that's about all the ARM support that they really yes, have. But that's that specifically only supports ARM and nothing else. It supports Raspberry Pi and nothing else because Welcome to ARM. Uh, each CPU has its own support model to do. It's yeah. annoying. Yeah, and like we said, engineers aren't free. Yes. <laughs> so, somebody's got to drop the time, and it's really just a matter of, do you feel like doing this today, Mr. Developer? No, not really. Okay, we'll move on and do something else. Yep. <clears throat> now, uh, of course, uh, Lin Linus had to come out and uh, defend the decision, because, you know... Uh, I don't know if he got strong armed into it, but uh, you know, people were asking him, and he, Linus, being you know like the Lord and Master of uh, the Linux kernel, decided he was going to make a statement. Probably because he had to, and probably because he got sick and tired of people asking him. And to quote Linus here, "Okay, lots of Russian trolls out and about. It's clear why the change was done. It's not going to get re re reverted." And using multiple random anonymous accounts to try to grassroot it by uh, Russian troll factories isn't going to change anything. And FYI, for actual innocent bystanders who aren't the troll from the troll farm accounts, the various compliance requirements are not just a U.S. thing. Yeah, yeah uh, it it's a uh, it's 
it's a rabbit hole of light Linus, I feel sorry for you, bud. Uh, people were asking you to make a comment, but maybe it was one of those few cases where it was probably better for you just not to say anything. Just like let yeah. a public representative say something for you in your stead. <laughs> just saying. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. Anyways, uh, it does make me wonder: can can uh, Russia support its own op? It's own Linux kernel. Possibly. I mean, there, there's a possibility, like, they could just, you know, get clone repository, uh, get clone from the Linux next uh, branch and then just yeah. compile that and run that themselves and just call that the Russia Linux. Because, you know, uh, Kafir a lot be different on that side of the world. Yeah. The question is also depends on how, how much of Western equipment will be flowing into Russia. So, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, it it's a it's a curi- it's a question of curiosity, and uh, I and I'm kind of curious as to what you the viewer uh, or a listener to to our show kind of think on this. It's like uh, if if Russian Li- if Russia Linux would actually come out and you know it performs to actually be it it turns out to be something actually fairly reasonable, would you switch to it? I I want to know. You can send us an email. Uh, to our general contact email address, uh, contact at tuxpace.com. It's a real email address, not an alias or anything like that. I mean, technically it is still an alias, but, uh, it's more real than the previous server that we ha- hosted it yeah. on. And, uh, you know, we even have a discord, uh, server that you can, uh, hop in and chat, chat with us on. It's not super active right now, but, uh, you know, the more people that join it, the more active it'll, it'll eventually get to be. And of course, big pod. We have what? big plans coming up at the end of the year. Yep. Uh, we have been talking about this back and forth for weeks now. We're going to be doing a live stream. Yeah, and it's and, not going to uh, be a short one. It's not going to be a short one because, you know, it turns out that I have shut down time for the last week of the entire year. So uh, yeah. I'm going to be bored with nothing better to do in my life. And uh, Big Pod, you're probably not going to have a whole lot to do to do either. Yeah. So, uh, what's going to happen is I'm going to set up a machine here, and it's going to be running an OB in an OBS window, just doing a 24/7 broadcast until like it either crashes or Big Pod decides that he's had enough. Something like that. Yeah, something and like that. It's got. It's gonna have you as a viewer will have a great impact on the length as well, because or viewer and listener, shall we say, because we will allow extensions to the stream by donations by patreon memberships by subscription subscription and possibly more check out yeah, the stream to see what else we're gonna be doing it shall yeah, be we're interesting st- we're, we're still working on details uh it might be like one of the streamathon things who knows yeah. uh we are gonna be we are we we're probably going to be recording an episode live at some point in the stream. Maybe multiple episodes, because heaven forbid, I'll have a spare time for it. <laughs> and if you want to see how it is edited, that will also happen. And we're going to have other interesting things happening during the stream. F- further schedule sh- shall be released closer to the stri- stream actually happening. But As there we are figure some... out what we're actually doing. But... We already have some interesting ideas for, for it should be interesting for you. Yeah. Now, uh, we are not going to be self-hosting the stream. We're just going to be posting it to YouTube. So, uh, yeah. sorry. Uh, but it turns out that uh, hosting is not cheap. But if you would like to financially incentivize us into, you know, setting up our own streaming service and everything to be able to handle this, go to patreon.com slash no tucks allowed. Drop us a couple dollars. I believe Patreon actually does allow you to input a custom amount. So if you want to pay us more I than I believe so, yes. Uh, so if you want to pay us more than our top tier, be my guest. <laughs> I'm yeah. not going to complain. But uh, we we've done the calculations on how long it would actually take, or or how much uh, bandwidth alone would actually cost us. It's not nearly as unreasonable as like I initially thought it was. Or not but, as I initially thought, but 
it's still they just bandwidth. So the problem yeah. is that you also need some actually high quality the high quality and a high gear system. So that's where the high cost is. And of course, also depends on how many users watch. That's also a problem. So if there is a lot of users who watch on our service, numbers uh, in the money department could skyrocket really quickly. Now, I, I know you can tell us to cheat and use WebTorrent, uh, which is what PeerTube does. But how many of you are actually going to talk to us on PeerTube compared to YouTube? <laughs> Not <laughs> or uh, something like that. But, uh, you know, I know that's a thing and we can totally try it. And I think that's going to, if you you want to shout at us uh, directly to tell, to tell Big Pod that he's wrong. And that uh, this could totally be done over PeerTube, and that he will hap- you will happily make an account on on PeerTube. You can shout at Big Pod directly by going to uh, this address that's showing up on the screen here. Uh, maybe it's flashing different colors for once. Who knows? Uh, Please don't but, make me do too much work. Please. Oh, oh, come on! It, it's just a keyframe. <laughs> I, I, I more meant not you, but the the view, viewer populace. <coughs> <laughs> with I mean, the whole it, setting up fine. a peer to be instance and making oh, come sure on. it we can, works and we can getting do the, like the whole hardware. server listing that way it only cost me a thousand dollars for the first five minutes <laughs> <laughs> well at the end of the day if, if we really wanted to we could we could pay some already established services to host the stream for us and even even uh, go with uh, what's called with restream or simulcast to to YouTube as well. One of them yeah, we already are in business with. But that's not manual enough for me. I want to be able to set up an Nginx relay server. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm trying to to not have to do as much work. Come on, because it's not it's that okay. I am okay with doing pre-preparation. It's okay. Problem is, it doesn't work. What do I do? Oh, no. That's the part well, I'm worried about. They already bundled the RTMP module in the Nginx container. <laughs> it's well, there. All you yes. have to do is just add a couple lines to the config file. Yes, but what if it It'll... breaks? I'm not going to go and fix it during the stream. I won't. Sorry. But that, could be, one, that could be a stream topic right there, fixing the stream. Great. W- w- when, it, when nothing is happening. Yes, great topic. Yeah, I really don't I mean, want to make that's myself what, more work when I'm going to really mean, have to be presentable and presenting for hours at a time for week at a time. <laughs> so what you're saying is uh, you're going to install Gentoo at some point on the stream? No, because that would be a very boring stream because half of it you wouldn't see anything because I do not have a uh, capture card so I couldn't install it on my laptop. Or B, yeah, that's it. I don't have a capture card, so I couldn't show you. Oh, we could fi- we could fix that probably. It's <laughs> it just depends if like if you want to give us money on the Patreon or not. <laughs> yeah, okay. But in the meantime, it, if you think that I'm hilarious, uh, here's my link right here. It's somewhere on the screen. But that's gonna be it for the show, guys. <laughs> we'll talk to you another time. And in the meantime, I'm gonna be going to bed because I gotta be up in like four hours and go going to work. And uh, Big Pod, I hope you have yourself a great rest of your day. Yeah. Uh, Go to sleep. Goodbye. All right. Bye.